we light our chalice today as chalices are lit in our brother and sister congregations across the world and as we light our chalice we will hear words from the Reverend Joan Montagna Unitarian Universalist Minister in Canada We light this chalice to remind ourselves of that flame which burns in each of our hearts, remembering that when flame meets flame, match meets candle, the two become one, belonging to one another. Many flames join together to form the warmth of community, of congregation, of town. We gather here together to remind ourselves of our inner lights and join with others to light the way to a good world community. But before we can shine a light on that path, we must remind ourselves who we are and we must know who we are. We are Unitarians, we are visitors, we are friends, we are neighbours, we are seekers. Let us worship together, whoever and wherever we are. Welcome. Welcome to our meeting here today at the Seven Oaks Unitarian Meeting House. We're standing on the edge of the next chapter in our lives. We stand on the edge of the next chapter in our lives every single day. Yet somehow there seem some bigger steps at the moment. This week sees two key festivals in the religious calendar. There is Mabon, the autumnal equinox, and there is Sukkot, the Jewish festival of thanksgiving. Both times of transition, of movement from the old to the new, of endings, of remembering where we've come from, but of beginnings too, of moving forward. Our lives are marked by beginnings and endings, sometimes voluntary, sometimes without warning. I'm not sure how many cabinet ministers there are watching this, but if you are there, you know that things can come without warning. Careers can end, careers can begin, changes, moves, starts, endings. Yet there are other starts too. Today, although we're here in Seven Oaks right now, but today in the afternoon on this Sunday, we will be reopening the Dover Unitarian Church for the first time since lockdown began 18 months or so ago. Fantastic, a new step. We will look back, but we will also look forward. We give thanks for the opportunity to gather once more. Our lives are a mix of endings and beginnings and reflections. And it matters not which of these you are at at the moment. We all face change at all times. We reflect this morning on changes. We reflect this morning on what drives that. We reflect today on who we are. This time, this space, are yours. I bid you a very warm welcome. Our first hymn is a song of gathering, a song to recognise the oneness of our community, no matter from where we might come, for all are welcome here. The words will be on your screens.
Our first reading today is by the Reverend Dr. Barbara Merritt, Unitarian Universalist Minister. This is from her book of Meditations and Reflections, Amethyst Beach. And this is a wonderful piece titled Excess Baggage. On our way to Maine one summer, my older son and I found ourselves following one of the most ridiculous looking cars I have ever seen. It was a sports utility vehicle, laden with all the evidence of American consumerism and conspicuous consumption. Lashed onto the top were a canoe and a kayak. Strapped onto the back bumper were four bicycles, golf clubs, Tennis rackets, camping equipment were visible through the Jeep's visible back windows. Every car that passed stared in astonishment at this visible study in recreational excess. The thing I found most remarkable about the vehicle in front of us was that we owned it. My husband and younger son were driving our Jeep up to Maine and we followed. After staring at our car for some miles and noticing the attention it was attracting from drivers by, I decided that this was an auspicious moment to have a discussion with my older child about non-materialism. I explained, trying to keep a straight face, that his father and I were dedicated to an ethic of simplicity, diminishing consumption and intentional reduction in material accumulation. My son greeted this pronouncement with hysterical laughter. Even I had to chuckle. But I was persistent. And after his raucous laughter subsided, I explained how, throughout our married life, we had both, both of us, consistently chosen jobs that paid less even when we were offered positions that paid more. How we'd invested our modest resources into education and travel rather than in real estate and furniture. And how we tried to constantly decrease our dependence and reliance on material wealth. Notwithstanding the visible evidence to the contrary, we were working to simplify our lifestyle. Robert listened to everything. And then he replied, I understand, Mum. You and Dad are non-materialistic. You just aren't very good at it. Words and perhaps a confession by Barbara Merritt. Let us come together in a time of prayer. O source of life and love, mystery beyond our ideas, as we gather this hour, we remember all of life's possibilities. We embrace the limits, grateful for a world awaiting the work of our minds and our hearts. We recall that our solitude and individuality is not all we are made for, that a wider communion of friendship beckons us. We struggle with a vision of a world made whole by loving justice. We forgive ourselves rather than denying the good that remains within us. We accept others rather than sitting in judgment over them. We constantly seek greater insight, greater honesty and perpetual love. We seek the strength to enter into life fully so that we can share and serve, so that we can bring light where there are shadows and liberation where there is despair. Such is our prayer, our vision, our hope this day.
God of many names, lover of all nations, we pray for peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our nations, in our world. We pray for peace. If you wish to, please join with me in the words of our final prayer, following those on your screens. Spirit of life, light everlasting, may the glorious returning rays pierce the depths of our hearts. May they purify, gladden, lighten and enrich us. We each of us harbour dark corners in our hearts, places of sadness, places of unworthy thoughts, places of good things left undone. May the light we receive today restore us. May the light we receive today bring us peace. May the light we receive today bring us into new life. In light, we might find hope. Amen. Our second reading today is by the former UN Secretary General, Doug Hammerskoet, who died 60 years ago this weekend, on the 18th of September 1960 in a plane crash in what is now known as Zambia, en route to try and broker peace in the Katanga crisis. Now, in addition to his formidable abilities as a negotiator and a statesman, he was also a deeply spiritual man. And a collection of his writings, called Markings, provides a rich and powerful source of inspiration and reflection. I'm going to read now a poem that he wrote in the 1920s, and it reflects on a sense of uncertainty, of not knowing quite what lies ahead, of the fear that next steps might generate within us. I am being driven forward into an unknown land. The pass grows steeper, the air colder and sharper. A wind from my unknown goal stirs the strings of expectation. Still the question, shall I ever get there? There where life resounds. A clear note in the silence. A poem about moving to the unknown from Dag Hammarskjöld, who died 60 years ago this weekend. We have a third reading this morning. And this third reading today is from Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Dominican friar, and this is from his book, Living and Loving. Now, Merton lived in the 20th century. He was a Catholic Christian mystic, and he was much drawn to Buddhist thinking too. Love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with another. 
We do not discover the secret of our lives merely by study and calculation in our own isolated meditations. The meaning of our life is a secret that has to be revealed to us in love, by the one we love. And if this love is unreal, the secret will not be found. The meaning will never reveal itself. The message will never be decoded. At best, we will receive a scrambled and partial message, one that will deceive and confuse us. We will never be fully real until we let ourselves fall in love, either with another human person or with God. The words of Thomas Merton. Our second hymn is actually listed in our book as an Easter hymn. And there is a reference in there about rolling away a stone, which has a bit of an Easter message to it. But Frank Claban's words are more than this. The words instead, I suggest, speak of the perpetual rebirth and new beginnings we face throughout the year. Moments of rebirth, moments of renewal, a new step on the path. The words will be on your screens. This week sees both festivals of Mabon, a moment to recognise the movement in the wheel of the year, 
as we experience the autumnal equinox this Tuesday. A day of equal night and day, or a time of equal night and day. A moment betwixt the light of summer and the journey toward the dark of winter. Yet it is too early this week, the Jewish festival of Sukkot. It's associated with thanksgiving in a number of ways. There is thanksgiving for the harvest, a link again to these changing seasons as we move through. Yet Sukkot is also a thanksgiving for liberation. It's from the story from the book of Exodus, the theme of Exodus, the transition of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt to liberation and a new start, the Jewish story of Exodus. These are both moments of transition, of recognising change, of welcoming change. We may not know where it's going to, we may not know what is ahead, but we welcome the change. And it's not a rare occurrence in our lives. As I said at the beginning, we are at the beginning of the next stage of our lives, always. We're always at the beginning. And since we weren't born yesterday, although sometimes I feel I may have been, since we weren't born yesterday, we are always finishing the previous stages of our lives. And we are always in transition. Now these can be good things. We can be bringing a difficult period to closure. We can be looking forward to a new beginning. We might be bringing a wonderful chapter in our lives to an end. We may be turning a page with an aspiration for something better or something good to continue. It may relate to our jobs, our relationships, our home life. It may relate to the pandemic. It may relate to our social lives. It may be something serious or joyful or solemn or inconsequential. Yet we're always moving from one thing to another in some way. Now, for many, these transitions are sometimes very hard to grapple with. Nobody likes change. But fear of change is more that people are concerned of, of the unknown ahead. Changing isn't the issue, it's what we're changing to or heading towards that's always going to be the problem. Now in our second reading today, you remember we had three readings, but in our second reading today, the words of Doug Hammarskjöld on the 60th anniversary of his sad and sudden death, we heard how our emotions can be played upon at time of change as we move from one chapter of our lives to another. He likened it to a journey. I am being driven forward into an unknown land. So change is happening. Life is making us accept that and finding ways to help us through it, yet it can seem overwhelming. The pass grows steeper, the air colder, and sharper. So as we continue our path, we can sometimes see we are headed towards something much more difficult than we believe we may be able to cope with. We might not let others know, or anyone watching us from afar might think we are coping fine. However, if you were actually in my body, as the change is tackled, you too would feel that coldness that Doug Hamishkold talks about. You too would know that the visible change that's not showing, an increasing sense of discomfort. A wind from my unknown goal stirs the strings of expectation. We know we must continue. The change is reality. The new chapter will provide more information and colour to the story of our lives. It stirs the strings of expectation. Now, to my mind, Doug Hammarskjöld describes that sense of change and foreboding well and manages this by drawing an analogy with the very physical sense of movement, of the walk ahead, of the wind on your face, gentle and encouraging. Now this sense of the physical 
is important in understanding our feelings, making connections with our deeper selves. Unitarians, however, have often received quite a rough ride on this. We've traditionally been known as the religion that thinks a lot. Indeed, our current literature, available for all good religious pamphlet racks, heralds the faith, phrase, the faith worth thinking about. We do thought. Highly cerebral. Not so keen on the physical sense, perhaps. I've never seen, for example, a Pentecostal-style Unitarian service with its clapping and dancing and speaking in tongues. Yet perhaps we should. Perhaps we should hold on to that physical bit more. Change is physical. This sense of the physical is important. The understanding of feelings is crucial. Now one group where you will have a lot of movement is within the Sufi group, a mystic Islamic group who have long recognised the importance of the physical in religious experience and devotion. The swirling dance of the Mevlevi order of Sufism is one particularly well-known expression, but it doesn't apply to all Sufis, nor is it actually the most common. It's just the one we see quite a lot of. But this idea of physicality. Now this is because as part of their Muslim faith, Sufis adhere to the practice of dhikr, and Dikir is an awareness of Allah, an awareness of God, commanded through the Quran, holy scripture of Islam. There are many different practices within the different branches and groupings within Islam, but this notion of becoming aware, of maintaining an awareness of God, or of the all that is, or of a connection to that greater everything, is crucial to a devotional and a spiritual life. Now the Sufis in particular have developed a wide range of practices to cultivate this awareness. Realising they are within God at all times. The whirling dance of the Mevlevis is one, but also singing and trance and dance and music. A physical connection to joy, to ecstasy, to God, to the all that is. Now this physical connection is something we can all manage in some way. You could make it by setting aside some time of silence and meditation, perhaps at the start of the day when you're thinking about your future, short term or long term. But it's also a time to take care of your soul, to prepare yourself for journeys ahead. Now for many Sufi orders, this meditation before beginning this meditation at the start of new things is led by breathing the Arabic word Bismala. Bismala. And in his book, The Sufi Book of Life, Neil Douglas Klotz provides a poetic translation of the word. Bismala, he says, we begin by remembering the sound and the feeling of the one being. The wellspring of love. We affirm that the next thing we experience shimmers with the light of the whole universe. So Bismala is, for ease of reference, that connection we might perceive with God, with the divine, with the all that is. By making both a mental and a physical connection to this wellspring of love, the Sufi prepares themselves for the journey ahead. And God, or love, or the divine, or grace, or however you might describe that intangible sense of well-being and goodness, will stay with you. If I may make a mercurial comment, 
Bismala, it will not let you go. So we reach a point where we recognise the importance as we move constantly in transition of calming our centre, of finding a connection with the all that is. It's a strength that might help us with those next steps. From that description of Bismala, it's the wellspring of love. The next thing we experience will shimmer with the light of the whole universe. Now this idea was mirrored and expanded a little in the words we heard in our third reading today. It was a piece by Thomas Merton, you may recall. Now Merton is a much respected figure. Catholic theologian, a monk, he wrote many books on the need for meditation for times of contemplation and prayer and connection with God. Now for Merton, it was a connection to Christ and to the wider universe that gave him the inspiration he needed to face life ahead. That won't work in specifics for everybody, yet his writings are clear that this was a personal approach and his recognition and development of other faith practices, notably from Buddhism, gives his writing a freshness of new exploration. Now in the piece we heard today, Thomas Merton sets out his idea that we cannot find the meaning of life alone, that we might only truly find it with another. And in the middle of the piece, he said this, we do not discover the secret of our lives merely by study and calculation in our own isolated meditations. The meaning of our life is a secret that has to be revealed to us in love by the one we love. This sense that we are unable to make a next step fully or in true intent without a sense of love deep within us, either through human contact or through alignment with the divine, or probably both, a connection with the all that is. As Neil Douglas Klotz has said in his understanding of Bismala, we need to remember the sound and the feeling of the one being. We need, as Merton says, to let ourselves fall in love with another or with our God. And this is very physical. This is a connection far away from where we think we might be needed to be in making our plans for the next chapter. We're used to thinking about the practicalities of the world or being prepared for change, no matter how uncomfortable. We're used to the idea that we might focus on the actual reality of what we're trying to do. However, perhaps the better way is to focus instead on making our whole lives, making our lives whole before we tackle the path ahead. The 12th century poet Sadi once wrote that every being is born for a certain purpose and the light of that purpose is kindled in its soul. Bismala indeed, the light of our purpose is kindled in our soul. At the start of this sermon, I suggested we're at the beginning of the next stage of our lives, always. We are always at the beginning of the next stage of our lives, and we're always finishing the previous stage of our lives. We are completing a chapter and starting the next one. Yet the two are part of the same longer story. We've heard more broadly today of the different approaches to taking the next step to writing the next chapter of our lives, of moving away from focusing solely on the task at hand and instead connecting with the wider world, with others, with the all that is, with our God, if that works for you. The light of our purpose is kindled in our soul and it is with divine influence, guidance and support we might find our way through.
Change is constant. It's never easy. And sometimes we really don't manage to make the difference we had hoped to. And that's fine. Barbara Merritt's piece on her family quest for simplicity is a useful reminder that sometimes we might try and it might take a little longer than we expected to get there. But it's all part of the story and the next chapter will change your life. Doug Hammerskold wrote in that journey that that journey is ever harder but there is a clear, pure note in the silence at its end. The Sufis and many others recognise that true strength to achieve is through love. Love of others, love of the divine, and by default, love of self. At a time of transition, Tumnal Equinox, recognising that movement from one time to another. At a time of celebration, of moving from a history, a past of slavery to a future of liberation, no matter how small or large that might be in your life. We are all finishing a chapter and starting another. May that chapter be written with feeling and with love. Bismillah. Let us come together in a time of stillness and reflection as we settle our bodies, perhaps closing our eyes, focusing on our breath. I shall speak some words and I shall strike the singing bowl and we shall come together in stillness and quiet together. That silence will be broken by music to continue our reflections. As we settle our bodies, I shall repeat those words from Neil Douglas Klotz a poetic and personal translation of the word Bismala. We begin by remembering the sound and feeling of the one being, the wellspring of love. We affirm that the next thing we experience shimmers with the light of the whole universe.
Some closing words. Spirit of life, be with us as we part. Bless those who are here. Bless those who are not here. Bless those we love and those we should love. Bless those who need our love and those whom we need to love. Bless those we would love if we knew them, and those we may never love. May there be peace amongst us all, now and forever. Amen.